Off the bench overtime, ESPN 104.5. We're going to hear what T-Bob and Jacob Hester have to say about Pete Carmichael remaining as coach of the Saints. I haven't watched this, obviously. I watch all the stuff with y'all live. Uh, look, here's the deal. We've gone over this Pete Carmichael thing. I'm interested to see if they talk about, as a player, what this what this like means for a player to hear that a coaching staff is coming back after underperforming. So I'm hoping they touch on that a little bit because that's obviously something I can't speak to. Um, I also hope they get into like the future. You know what this looks like long term for the Saints. We hinted at that a little bit in my video, so maybe we get a chance to expand. T. Bob, Jacob, take it away. Yesterday, boys, it was announced that uh, Dennis Allen citing the um, Pete Carmichael's track record, the history that they have together. They do not feel that any major needs uh, moves need to be made to get this offense going that Carmichael will be able to figure out. And then maybe intimating that some, uh, that some changes underneath Carmichael would maybe happen. And, and, and perhaps they think that that. So th this Obviously, I've had a ton of engage engagement on Twitter and in my YouTube comments and all the places you can reach me. All those links are below. I've had a lot of engagement with people saying, you know, maybe this is a shift away from Carmichael as the play caller. And it's a different kind of, he, he's more of a strategist. He's more of a, you know, a game planner. And to me, that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, to me, it's like, why keep him on if that's the case? He is the offensive coordinator. He has been the offensive coordinator for 17 years. I understand that when Sean Payton was here, Sean Payton had the, you know, the ultimate authority with the offensive part of the game plan. But the fact that Pete Carmichael at this stage can't call plays the fact that at this point now he can't figure out who to put on the field, the fact that at this point now he can't even he can't even get the personnel in positions to get them to succeed, if that's all the case, what does he do? What does he do? Does he break down film? Is he a game strategist that just can all 22? If so, get his ass off the sidelines, keep him in the booth, let him watch the tape, let him watch the all 22, I will watch the All-22 with them. I will volunteer my hours. You only had to put me on the staff or on the salary. I'll volunteer my hours to walk this clown through an All-22 and how to break it down. Because I'm doing it from the stands seven crown and sprites deep. Okay? So if he's just breaking down film and if he is just game planning, then why when it comes time to do the game, he cannot figure it out. If he's game planning and he's strategizing, whatever he's doing, if he's doing that all week, why can he not figure out how to call a screen pass? Why can he not figure out how to get Alvin Kamara the, the ball in space? Why can he not figure out how to get Taysom Hill involved? That's what I don't understand. If he, if he can do one, then he should be able to do the other come game time. And I do understand that this is his real first time with the ultimate play calling you know, duties. I understand that. Okay, so I, I, I could even, if he was, and I said this in my video yesterday, if he was a C minus at literally anything and an F at play calling, then maybe I'd be like, you know what? Okay, okay, he, he can grow, but at least he's a C minus in that. He's an F across the board. I could write the ship, which led to one very funny tweet, and, and, and I apologize that I can't source the tweet or stuff like I do normally. I actually left everything at home. Uh, this morning, so we're flying a bit blind today. Yeah, you stole my computer. I know, I know. I apologize. I apologize. Um, How'd you forget everything at home? Uh, Your I don't backpack, know. everything? I it's a good example of just how good I am at this. Not only do I not forget anything, I don't even have anything. I have no notes. I've never done a show with notes. I've never gone into a video prepped with stats, with any research in front of me. All this genius that I spout nonstop is just off the top of the dome. Most of the time, after eight hours of work. Most of the time, hungover. Slept, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I slept too good, which is great. Energy levels through the roof. Show prep and equipment, all time low. Okay, so once <laughs> we, we can line those up. We can line up the sleep with the equipment. We're going to be back to full strength here pretty soon. Feel great, though, and that's the main thing. Uh, but not because of the Saints news. But it did lead to a very funny tweet where uh, somebody's like, yeah, okay, 
Saints are going to uh, change the tight end coach and then think that that's going to fix this uh, this New Orleans Saints offense. I don't know, Jake. It's crazy, too, because the, the, our tight end, Jawan Johnson, was one of the strongest parts of, of the team. Like, we, 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 we're we moving around our, our tight end coach when that was that was one of the bright spots. Um, Maybe he can be the officer coordinator. I mean, we, 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 we've talked about it a lot. You look at the NFL. You look at the teams that are having the most success. Uh, there are some of the teams that are doing the most pre-snap movement, uh, manipulating matchups, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have the Saints who ran – the least amount of pre-snap movement in the NFL. They ran the least amount of play action. They try to run Alvin Kamara consistently through the tackles. It's kind of been a theme throughout the year that the offensive philosophy has been lacking. But it looks like the Saints, and we told you this. I told you. This is how the ownership group and power group views themselves. I love hearing this from T-Bob. And, you know, because we say these things every week. Or the, we talk about philosophy, the unimaginative play calling the design the lack of play action the lack of screens the lack of motion the lack of movement the fact that we're all seeing the same things ladies and gentlemen i think means that it's damn real look around the nfl he just laid it out who are the best coaches who are the best offenses who are the funnest offenses to watch i'll just name a few the san francisco 49ers the miami dolphins the kansas city chiefs the buffalo bills the cincinnati Bengals. Do we look anything like them? But James, we don't have Joe Burrow. But James, we don't have Debo Samuel and Christian McCaffrey. I don't mean the players. I don't mean the results. Do we look anything like them in scheme, philosophy, design, anything? Okay? Anything. The Kansas City Chiefs against all San- or against the Raiders were spinning around in a, in a circle in the huddle and broke the huddle spinning around in a circle. We can't even design a screen pass. That's how far behind we are right now. And that's the biggest problem. The rest of the league is getting younger. It's getting more creative on offense. That's the main two driving forces in the NFL right now. I know a lot of people are, you know, they, they miss the fullbacks. They miss their defenses. They miss the 3 nothing games. Well, I'm here to tell you that's over. The, right now, the last teams in the NFL, what are they? They're offensive teams. They're offensive teams. That's exactly what they are. They're dominant offenses. Yes, Frisco has a great defense, but they, they're one of the best offenses in, in the NFL. You can't win in this league right now without having a good creative offense and a young staff. We're not doing any of that. We're doing the opposite. We're, st- we're being stable. We're being consistent and being old and unimaginative. Is um, They're going to be hesitant to make major changes. Uh, they, they kind of view themselves like the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Where they're not going to be reactive and keep kind of chasing this drag, and they're going to give guys a chance to figure it out. And uh, it looks like they landed on, uh, let's just run it back. Just run it back last next year. The, I think it, what, what, what kind of sucks is, Jake, this team, well, I, I guess uh, they lose a lot of this credit with how they played in that last game, how putrid it was, losing to Carolina, absolutely pathetic. But I was going to say that, this team finishing strong deserves to be applauded, but in the end, it may have led to what most people feared the most, which was it gave you just enough of a glimmer where they're like, nope, you know what? I think we're fine. I think we're fine. Yeah, I mean, I, 100%. I agree because, you know, we finished 7 and 10, and we came on strong at the end besides the Carolina game, no doubt. Like, the offense looked like they were playing better as far as, like, Dalton and just the way it was clicking. Like, you know, there, there was something there. We weren't just rolling over, and the team played hard. And to – that is a detriment right now because we can go two ways, I, I think. I guess we could technically go three. But I think we can really go two. And they're vi- wa- vastly different. Seven and ten to slightly upgrade from seven and ten. You're talking about winning nine, ten games. Still not great, but you're competitive. You're above average. Maybe, maybe even a playoff team. Now the flip side is if you're winning five games or four games, you're one of the worst teams in the NFL. So we are on a razor's edge with how we finish the season. An absolute razor's edge. And the bad part is, I have absolutely no reason to believe that we can take that step forward. That we can look ahead and and be like, oh, well, this person will get better, this person will get better, this will happen and this will happen, and if all that happens, we'll win 10, 11 games. I don't see any of that stuff. The only thing I can see is, well, 
Our main core is getting a year older. I have no confidence in Dennis Allen and Pete Carmichael. The rest of the NFL is getting younger and better. Like, all those things, it's like, well, all that to me kind of spells, a, like, taking a step back. And that, that's scary. And, you know, the Steelers, they had the benefit of having Mike Tomlin, one of the best coaches ever, really. He's never had a losing season. Dennis Allen is the opposite. Dennis Allen is the most consistent loser head coach that there is. And I don't even mean loser is like just like a, a jab at him. I mean, literally, he's the most consistent losing head coach probably in the NFL. Out of, I've done the, the numbers before. He's winning sub, three, sub uh, 300% win, win percentage. Sub. He's winning like, he's batting like 280. He has like a 280% win percentage. I mean, it's ridiculous what this guy's done his entire career, and we expect something to change. We are being stable. I will give Loomis that. But I got a feeling we're being stable in mediocrity or worse. Fine, we, 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 we can figure this out. Can yeah. that. I, I, so when you look at the numbers, uh, they're 19th in points per game. Uh, I think they were, or sorry, 19th, I believe, in yards per game. I think they're 22nd in points per game. So it's not great, and it's not awful enough to be like, Hey, you got to you got to make the move. Like you, you got to press. Like you're 29th in offense, and so like it's right in that gray area of trying to make a move. For me, what I was disappointed in was the things that you mentioned. Like you're not being creative. Like yes. the, the no motion stuff. Like that you can't explain that to me to make sense. Not with the weapons. Yes, thank that you. You have like you have weapons that feel like you could create a game plan that would be yeah. very confusing for all the defenses that you play. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Utilized. He has incredible. Like, if you gave, I, I'll tell you this right. I, I'll say it because I can't prove it. If you gave, if you just switch rosters, and you put the New Orleans Saints in San Francisco 49er uniforms, and you put the Niners in Saints uniforms, I guarantee you the Niners would not be playing anymore. I guarantee you they would have either not made the playoffs or been eliminated. Every team is talented, besides like the very bottom couple. Every team has talented players. Every team has mismatch options. You don't think Kyle Shanahan could figure out what to do with Alvin Kamara and Taysom Hill? You don't think he could utilize Chris Olave? That all, the, the offensive weapons are strong. And we, just like Jacob said, there's nothing that you can tell me that makes sense of why he can't get Kamara lined up in space. Why he can't get him the ball... You know, throw, why he can't throw Kamara the ball on screens. Why he can't have Kamara running routes. And I really, really press this Kamara thing because I think it's a bigger, it's, it's like the most glaring part of the bigger issue. The fact that you can't use the shiniest toy, the fact that you can't use the easiest thing on the team because you can just do what Sean did with Kamara for his entire career, you can't even replicate that. You can't even do that. I always use the 14-year-old with a Ferrari thing. If a 14-year-old watched someone drive a Ferrari and sat in the, in the passenger seat, I would assume, even if he's just kind of faking it, he could probably figure it out a little bit just from watching for 15 years, or as long as people Carmichael is. That was kind of a confusing metaphor at the end there. But you know what I'm saying. Like, that's what I, I cannot understand because you know, people, people harp on the numbers a lot. People harp on the yards per play, yards per game, points per play, poor, all that stuff. And we, we're, we're, we're data-driven here. We're, we're as analytical of the YouTube channel as you'll find, for sure. But it's more the simple stuff. Why aren't people moving around pre-snap? Why aren't we running imaginative sets? Why isn't Alvin Kamara running routes? You cannot tell me that Pete Carmichael is good at his job when those things are not, are not happening. It's impossible the weapons that you have like i didn't feel like they did a great job at all at doing that like it's like there was no rhyme or reason there was no flow there was no chemistry no philosophy no scheme so like, no spine we say it every week 19th in yards and and think a whole lot because for me that's not even where my mind goes my mind, my mind goes to the lack of creativity and having no purpose for you know things like and we talk about a lot like Taysom hill like it's like the games they did it they won. And the games they didn't, they lost. And then sometimes they would do it a little bit. Sometimes they wouldn't do it at all. It's like, you just, you, you got to be consistent with what you're trying you gotta to do. You got to have a scheme. You got to have a reason. You got to have a philosophy. Uh, Jameis and Andy Dalton. And, and I know you had an injury to Michael Thomas, but, and then with the running game, I think the running game, and obviously we'll watch more Saints football than we do other teams. It was maybe the least creative 
running it was. attack that I've seen. Yes, it was between the tackles, nonstop. On the NFL meta, at least, things are shifting a bit, and creative running is starting. Like, kind of going back to, old school a yeah, little bit. Say, it's starting to become the hallmark of, well, right, the same old school concepts, like we always talked about, wrap up in some yes. new ways to deliver power and deliver counter. Like- this is what the NFL is about now. The NFL is about finding the mat- mismatches, exploiting them, period. That's it. The really good coaches can identify the weak link on the defense, whether it's in the secondary, on the defensive line, whatever. Then they get creative in how they can exploit that. Or the opposite way of doing that would be figure out who your best players are offensively and figure out creative ways to get them into successful positions. That's it. The old school way of playing football or looking at football or thinking about football was you line up your guys, they line up their guys, the bigger, tougher, stronger team is going to win. Now it's all about misdirection. Now it's about cloaking your, your offense and cloaking players and, and design and style. And that's why you see so much pre-snap movement. You didn't have to have pre-snap movement in the 80s because everyone was running straight, right? Everyone, How many times did you see Emmett Smith get the ball in some misdirection with a, with a slot receiver pulling? and all, all, it, it never happened. It was just turn around, hand him the ball, let him go straight. So that is the new NFL. And the Saints, they are correct. The running game this year has been virtually four things. It's just been run right, run left, run up the middle, draw. That's it. There's been no nothing creative. And that that is the problem, like I said 10 seconds ago. It's not the results. It's the philosophy, the scheme, all that stuff. Game to game it changed. Quarter to quarter it changed. In Arizona... When we ran the ball 11 times, and again, I can just pull this stuff up. Boom, no notes anywhere near me. In Arizona, when we ran the ball 11 times in the first half, and we ran it twice in the second half, or Camara, excuse me, ran Camara 11 times in the, fir- in the first half and twice in the second half, that tells you they are just winging it. When, when ja- the Jacksonville Jaguars, but James, we were losing. When the Jacksonville Jaguars were losing to the Chargers t- 27 to nothing, Doug Peterson didn't give up on the run. Because Doug Peterson knows who the hell his team is. He knows the identity. He knows the scheme. He knows the structure. He just keeps doing it. He keeps doing what is going to put his team in successful positions. And what happened? Like, yeah, so you are going the opposite direction of what the most successful teams in the NFL seem to be doing. It's kind of the overall main point, I feel like. Yes. So For sure. Thought, I think a lot of us thought that they would make some moves because yes. what do we always talk about? Like when some someone's taken over – uh, a new job or their head coach for the first time and they have a bad season. Like, man, we don't have a lot to fall back on. Yeah. Like if you're a fan, you can't fall back on remember the good times. Remember oh, or, yeah, or sure. remember what they did at that other place. We are Brent Venables. Yeah. I mean because I, I know Pete Carmichael <laughs> called plays the year that Sean was suspended. But that was even like that you felt like Sean still like cause yes, yeah, he Drew wasn't Brees, there, but you had Drew Brees and you were still you're still part of it. You know what I'm saying? Hundred percent. So I again I referenced so on Twitter today. I was t- I, I, there's been a lot of talk of like let's not disparage what Carmichael's done in the past. You know he's been super successful, and this is the point I think Jacob's getting at, and this is the point that I've been getting at. Has he? He was on the staff, but how involved was he if he can't do these basic things? Am I to believe that he was doing all this stuff in the background? For the last 15 years that made the Saints the best offense in the NFL for almost two straight decades. You're, I'm to believe that he was the mastermind behind some of that. But then now he can't bring any of that to the forefront. Doesn't that lend itself for you to believe that maybe he wasn't as, as involved as we think? Was, it, was he involved at all? So I'm sure he was in the room. I'm sure he was having conversations. But if he can't do anything if he can't show any of that why am i to to believe that he was some huge cornerstone of that just because he was wearing the same shirt just because he was on the sideline i heard a lot of that today you know it's like he was he was part of the greatest offense in the nfl for 10 years so was so were ball boys and and assistant running back coaches and you know how much how much say did how much say did the wide receiver coach in 2011 have on the offense I don't know so how much say did Pete Carmichael have on the offense hell if I know 
All I know is he was wearing a coach's shirt and he was standing on the sidelines. As far as what he mastermind, masterminded, if that's a word, I don't know. Because I certainly can't see it. I certainly haven't seen anything this year to make me think, ah, yes, this was the man part of the brain trust that created the high-flying Saints offense. And, and so, like, the year he steps away, like, we don't have anything to fall back on. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to say it. I actually thought it was going to work out well. I, I, I did. From day one, I said it wasn't. Paid for so long, it was the right move to make, I should say. And I said that from the jump. And I'll give myself a pat on the back, per usual. I said from the jump. There's a good chance Pete Carmichael didn't do a damn thing when Sean Payton was here. There's a good chance that if you're, I'll, 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 I'll put it to you real simple. If you're the offensive coordinator for the best offense in the NFL for 10 straight years, and you never, ever get a, get a look at being a head coach somewhere else, isn't that a little strange? Ben Wilson for the Lions has been the offensive coordinator for nine months. The Lions are probably the, Seventh best offense in the NFL this year, and he's getting interviewed by everybody on the planet. The Eagles' offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach is getting interviewed for the head coaching job. Defensive coordinators for the Cowboys, for the 49ers, they're getting head coaching job interviews. Ken Dorsey, it's his first year calling plays in Buffalo. He is getting head coaching interviews. So isn't it strange that Pete Carmichael didn't get a serious look at a head coaching job if he was masterminding one of the best offenses in the NFL year after year after year after year? I don't think so, because I think the rest of the NFL knew that it wasn't Pete Carmichael. It was Sean Payton. It was not what I thought it was going to be. I don't think it was what anyone thought it was going to be, because lack of creativity is not what I would have had Pete Carmichael in. Uh, no, yeah, I, 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 I... I I agree. It's surprising how it happened. Um, Another pause. Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel was with on his staff. Mike McDaniel goes to Miami. You can see the imprint that Mike McDaniel has on Miami's offense. So you know that he was part of what San Francisco did, right? You all feel me? If Mike McDaniel left Frisco, went to Miami, and they're running a basic-ass offense with no creativity and it's just the same old shit, then you can say, okay, well, this guy, he was kind of riding Kyle Shanahan's coattails. That's what we had with Pete Carmichael. I guess Dan Rauscher has been let go, tight ends coach, run game Yeah, he was let go yesterday. That is uh, the only move that has happened thus far. That is it. Look, (sighs) run game coordinator... (laughs) A lot of times is a title to give you more money. Yeah, that's okay. That Passing game coordinator is a title to give you more money. Okay. Assistant head coach is a title to give you more money to justify giving you more money because maybe you thought they were a really good tight end coach. Now, are you involved in the game plan as far as what the the, the running scheme looks like? Yeah, but you'd be that if you weren't the running game coordinator. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, like at the end of the day. Pete Carmichael's looking at his sheet, and he's not, like, yelling over, like, hey, like, what do we run here? And he gives the call for the – no. And they come up with a game plan together. Like, he would have a say in the game plan regardless if he had yeah. that title. title. So, like, not, that yeah. to me is not going to do anything. Yeah, that's not yeah, – I, yeah. uh, I mean, that's not I – mean, that's a nothing burger. We coordinators in San Diego. Norv was the office coordinator. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, Talk about they North had Turner. the title. They made the money. But they literally had no effect on what Norv was going to call. Same with Sean. The Alabama DC being replaced is Nick Saban still the defensive coordinator, or has he no. finally transcended? Yeah, he actually lets the DC run his stuff now. Yep. Right? Okay, yeah, and he's offering input. I figured it. Was that's di- that's yeah. totally different. And that that's totally different. That's totally different. In college, the head coach is his main job is to recruit, and Nick Saban has done a great job. And you see this in college a lot. These like figure head coaches. Joe Paterno was a figure head coach. Bobby Bowden was a figure head coach. Where their their headset might not have even been plugged in. They were just walking the sideline, going and recruits. You know, their their coordinators were actually calling the game. And you've seen that with Alabama. You know, Lane Kiffin, he was calling the offense for sure. He's calling that offense. Nick may have a say, but it's up to Lane. So college has shifted a little bit. The NFL. Exactly like Jacob said. Sean Payton is the head coach. Pete Carmichael is the offensive coordinator. Sean Payton is calling the plays. They may be in the same room watching tape and stuff, but he is not looking at Pete Carmichael and saying, Pete, hey, dingus, clown number one. 
It's third and one here in the NFC Championship game. What do you want to call? Pete Carmichael, I would guess, had the same say that I did, and I was sitting 40 rows back. Even that input is probably Which, again, like minimal we were compared about, to what it used to be. Yeah, and like we always talk about, you can't really coordinate on the college level as much anymore. You still can in the NFL. Like you can still be a head coach coordinator in the NFL oh, yeah. because you don't have to deal with Pirtle, all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't have to go to the uh, touchdown yeah. club in the yes. middle of the week. Yes. So this has been rattling right around in my brain. And this, yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. I'd be <laughs> so mad. I'm like, I have so much crap to do. I know. And I got to go do. I mean. And this is no disrespect because I love ribs, okay? But, like, with everything I have to do, it would, at the end of a long day, it would feel kind of like a lot to go to TJ Ribs <laughs> for the fan show at, like, 7 p.m. Like, just think about how us normal human uh. beings approach our schedules and work. And then think about uh, like at an of of Wednesday, <laughs> end of the day, middle of a game week. You got to go. Uh, you got to go to TJ Ribs. It's uh, brutal. Yeah, like, I don't know how college coaches do it. Do I really don't. It is. No, we're that's just why. saying it. That's why you do it. Yeah. My cousin was a a community college uh, assistant coach. I remember he'd call sometimes and he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm, it's a Tuesday at 6 p.m. I'm driving from you know Podunk, Mississippi, because I had just had to have dinner at some recruit's house." It's like Jesus Christ! Like, because you you you're on that whole time. You're sweet talking the recruits, sweet talking the moms, sweet talking the dad, whatever. You're eating some trash ass food, middle of nowhere. Get home at eight p.m. You know, it, it's a, college. College is hellacious. I don't know. I don't know. The NFL I think has it pretty easy coaching wise compared to college. Well, you're competitive. Like it's not probably the best. It's feeling. competitive, but everything in life is opportunity cost, and uh, yeah, that just that would that would oof, be a lot. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I think here's what I'm trying to say. It's been rattling around in my head. I think Let it in out. terms of keeping Carmichael, like whether or not it's the right move. It's not. If you just focus on the football, I think there's some uh, discussion room there, right? Like, like, like what? you said, Jake, it wasn't just flat out. Like we're not like Nathaniel Hackett, Russell Wilson. It's not Russell Wilson. Do you hear Russell Wilson reaching out to Sean Payton? Uh, asking him to basically come fix him. Yes. Like Russell Wilson's a law, which would you feel for Russ there? That's a bad place to be when you feel like th- that's a man who feels as if he has lost kind of all confidence in himself, which may be at odds with the public persona that Russell Wilson is putting out there, but how could he not be having a bit of a crisis of conscience, right? So it's not that bad of a disaster. I mean, you had Andy Dalton. And it's close. You put up some respectable numbers at times. And so from the pure football perspective, I accept there's some debate room. You can argue, and there's some wiggle room about whether or not um, the staff should stay the same. From the PR standpoint, which you could say doesn't matter as much, but from the it fan does. standpoint. Yes, this is what this I talked about a lot yesterday. Abject failure. Yes. Um, after yes. a year that was so listless, so disappointing in so many big moments, yes. you had to have it. Uh even even going the extra mile again to lose that last game where you were really working towards if you'd gone eight and nine, you were working towards having some actual like good feeling heading into the off season. Uh, you were uh, you were working towards uh, ending on a very positive note. The four in a row to seem so ridiculous. You're the Carolina Panthers standing there. That's fine. They suck. They got nobody. You go and you lose ten to at, home. at home. At home. After scoring on the opening drive of the game. And Sam Darnold had 50 yards passing. It just felt pathetic. And like much of this year, Jake, it was like, okay, you did a lot of good things, but then you did a couple huge bad things to kind of ruin the day. And so from a pure PR standpoint, when that much bad will is generated and that much anger is generated, the people demand blood. The people demand heads will roll. The people demand demand change to give hope so you don't feel like you're just going to be watching – Dalton and Allen and Carmichael again. Hundred percent. From the fan side of things, this is the biggest middle finger. Stone Cold Steve Austin break the glass. Three sixteen says, "I just kicked your ass." Middle finger. That's what this was. Do you want to watch that shit again? Do you want to watch what what we just saw again? If I told you, Saints fans, let me know in the comments below. If I told you that next year will be a carbon copy of this year, seven and ten. Eh, average, you know, lose some tight ones, win some games, have a couple comebacks. Exact same. Would you want that? Would you be excited for Saints games come Sunday? I sure as hell wouldn't. This season, towards the end of the season, felt like a chore. It felt like a chore to watch this team. It felt like a chore to watch them in Pittsburgh. 
Do you want that again? Because that's what the that's what the front office is telling you. You're about to get. The front office is telling you you're going to get that again. And the biggest middle finger of the whole thing is that it took them 10 days to decide that. Mickey Loomis sat there and told us they were going to assess everything. They were going to go through their processes. And I believed him. And then three days later, they came out and said, LMAO, JK, no changes here. So it is a total, and you can look at yesterday's video's comments. People in the comments are saying, boycott the Saints. I'm not excited for the season. I hate this. I, I, I'm trading in my fan card. I'm watching another team. I'm rooting for the Pelicans. I'm not excited for game days. This is going to ruin the city. And I know it's a knee-jerk reaction, but there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in people aren't excited. There's a lot of truth in season ticket numbers might drop. There's a lot of truth in attendance might drop. There's a lot of truth in that. And that's not even factoring in what happens if we start 0-3. What happens if we that first game of the year, if we, if we lose 24-6? to People will be screaming in the streets for blood if we start out looking like shit because everyone expects us to be bad. Everyone expects the season to be bad. Everyone is saying that we're going to be bad. If we actually are bad, oh my God, I don't think there's any way Loomis, Allen, or Carmichael survive a bad start. I don't think there's any way they keep their jobs if we have another 7 and 10 year. And that's, that's kind of what I was saying with the record thing. If we go 8 and eight and 9, it's an improvement. But is that what y'all want? Y'all want to run this shit back? The difference, the difference between six wins, seven wins, and eight wins ain't much. The difference between seven wins and nine wins ain't that much. We, we're, I mean, if you told me that Allen and Carmichael were going to be around for an additional two years, and next year we go eight and nine, and then the year after that we go nine and nine and eight, oh my God, that is some average, mediocre football to watch for three years. And I do not want that at all. Next year, and uh, the Saints said, well, we don't see it the same way, which honestly is not the worst thing from an ownership or leadership group, right? Maybe not be beholden to the... Yeah, to the, you, you, you don't want to make the... You don't want, who, you don't want to have the fans making all the decisions, for, for sure. It's, it's a bad situation. It's going to win the Saints, no fans. So I guess what I'm yes. saying is it's not an outright awful move, uh, oh. but it's going to feel awful. And it's, 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 it's already setting the tone for people to be angry throughout the entirety of the offseason. Anytime 100%. you have a bad year, like someone has to fall in the fans' eyes. No one fell. Right, wrong, or indifferent. That's always how it is. <laughs> the gods demand blood. It, and <laughs> so when you come back and you're basically going to be the same staff, that's why you're going to have fans upset. And my last point on the offense, it's not even that it was bad. My problem was it was safe. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yeah. even safe. It never got out of a territory where they were trying to be safe. It never tried to be, you know, a little. It wasn't safe. The Texans are safe. When Lovey Smith was running Damian Pierce 30 times a game, it was like, okay, this is a dude who just, he's just phoning it in. He's just, he's just running the ball. He doesn't give a shit, whatever. I can, I can handle that. If we would have walked in every single Sunday and we knew Alvin Kamara is about to run the ball 30 times a game, if we knew that, if it was like, it's going to be Captain Checkdown Andy, we're going to run Alvin 40 times, and we're going to get out of there, okay, I can live with that. But I can't live with the no scheme, random, flip a coin, uh, run play. Which one? Spin a wheel, run play number three. I can't handle that. I can't handle Taysom's getting the ball 10 times this game, one time the next game. Kamara's getting seven carries. Kamara's getting 18 carries. I can't handle that. I can't handle the no scheme, no consistency, no philosophy. That is way worse than playing it safe. Plenty of teams play it safe, and that's okay. This was something totally different. They honestly might have, might as well have had all the plays in a box, and then before every play or every down, they should have just pulled a play out and ran that play. That would have been more consistent somehow than what they were doing. Reckless, which is okay, right? You, you can be reckless and still have a plan like i think the 49ers offense is reckless like there's a lot going on yeah. there's, there's a lot of things that could go wrong but uh that's a different video for a different day i don't think they're reckless i think a team like i could uh, you could argue like the chargers can be kind of reckless um schematically or just kind of their philosophy I, I don't think the Niners, i think the niners are almost the opposite they're just like a super well-oiled machine there's a lot of moving parts 
but there's really important scene. To, it, it's almost like a really fancy watch where there's a lot happening, but it's happening in such a such so much synchronization. Like it's it's almost kind of beautiful. It's it's not it's not really reckless. I don't think KC could be reckless in the past. Buffalo can be very reckless. Uh, Buffalo's offense is very reckless because Buffalo's offense right now, thanks to Ken Dorsey, is mostly just like let Josh Allen go and do whatever he wants to do. And that's why you're seeing them turn the ball over so much. I mean, Buffalo, they may be second in the NFL in turnovers. It's something crazy, but they're, they are absolutely reckless. I don't think, I don't think the, the Niners, I would not classify them as reckless. I mean, Brock Purdy doesn't even turn the ball over, and I think he doesn't turn the ball over because he's working in such a safe, consistent system that, uh, yeah, I, I would say more, more Buffalo is more of like a, a good example of like a high-powered offense that's also very reckless. But they know exactly what they're doing, and they live in organized chaos, if you will. And I, that's, so that's I enjoy true. watching it. When I watch the I love 22 watching of the Saints, it's not that it's bad. It's just safe. Mm. It's a little boring. And it kind There's of defines not, everything. It, and it defines the entire yeah. philosophy, right? I mean, that's the problem here. All of this is safe. And keeping Dennis Allen to try to chase the Sean Very Perry good Green, point. Which is safe. Give me Pete Carmichael, Pete Carmichael, this offseason. Like, and, and that's where you, you got to start to wonder, are the Saints chasing a golden era that cannot be recaptured, right? Like, 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 like a man um, trying to hold on to water as, as it leaks through his hands or sand. Like, there's, My boy T-Bob like, getting all poetic. That's a good question, though. Because Loomis... I wonder if he believes I, I kind of see it both ways. I wonder if he's trying to say, look, this is what we do. As long as I keep these pieces together, we have a chance of glory. Or I wonder if he's saying like, maybe he knows that shit's over. And maybe he's, this is the new, cause we kind of call it lightning in a bottle. It's hard to know how much of what they were doing worked and how much it was just having Sean Payton and Drew Brees and that, and that's it. You know, and now you don't have either one of them. There, I don't think you can say like there is a golden era that's being held on to. There is nothing left from that era. I mean, Andy Dalton is our starting quarterback. You know, we we're in this weird. We're almost like in a a state where like time is standing still because we're not holding on to anything from the past. There's no. There's nothing. There's nothing really there. That that there's no Sean Payton. There's no Drew Brees. You could argue like Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers. You could argue Green Bay is holding on to the past, right? They're they're like we were we've been really good. So as long as we keep Rodgers happy, we'll always be good. And now they're they're not now they're not good, you know. But or then you look at a team that's super front loaded, a team that's like, well, we may suck right now, but we have a ton of picks moving forward. We're going to be great in a few more years. We just got to make the right draft picks. Give us a few years, you know. That would be like the the Bears, I guess. And then there's us who we don't have a future because we don't have draft picks. We don't have any like, really young players to be excited about. We have a lot of A, but I mean, you know. But we're also not like giving the quote-unquote Aaron Rodgers, like we're not holding on to that either. We're stuck in some, some kind of a weird limbo. In Breeze or Peyton and Breeze. They are still trying to hold on to that identity, and I understand why. It's the only truly um, mega successful uh, period of time in the franchise's history. It's a golden era. They're chasing a golden era. Except, like, it, it, it's kind of like after the Romans pulled out of England, right? And, like, a generation later, Jake, you have all these, you know, these, these Britain barbarians, and they're, like, seeing these, like, Roman statues and buildings. You're like, who built these? Like, gods must have built these. I don't, I don't understand this at all. Like, that's the same to this point. The internet has been pulled, and they're trying to figure out how to recapture the glory of ages past, but they don't have the architects. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the people that did it before. Making so a lot instead, of sense. Instead, what, what you know, a lot of people would argue they need to do is do something new. Except yes. that, that era has ended and tried to move fully forward into a new one. And That's that what I'm saying. Happening. And maybe I end up. That is 100% what I'm saying. I'm 100% saying the old era is over. It's obviously over. The only way we're going to be good again is finding a new era. Dennis Allen is not a... I think all three of us are kind of coming to the same realization here. Dennis Allen cannot create a new era. He's not that good enough of a coach. He's not even that average of enough of a coach. 
Pete Carmichael can't create a new era offensively. He's, he's proven that. You're going to need new blood like Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel, play, coaches like that who created a new era for that team. I don't mean literally those three guys, but Sean McVay created an era in Los Angeles. Kyle Shanahan has created an era in San Francisco. Mike McDaniel is creating an era in Miami. John Harborough created, and Greg Roman, my boy, created an era in Baltimore. You know, we and players can do it too. Joe Burrow has created an era in Cincinnati. Josh Allen in Buffalo. Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City with, with Andy Reid. I got to give him credit. We don't have the player or the coach to create a new era. And as long as Mickey Loomis declines to truly try and start that new era, that I think we are going to be mediocre, average to bad until we find that. Whether it's a player, it might be Caleb Williams. I don't know. If we get the first overall pick, Caleb Williams comes in, he may usher in an era. If we go find some hot shot young offensive mind, he may do it. But we're not going to get there if we if we try and stay stable in what we have right now. They're being proven wrong. Maybe an architect comes along and they figure out how the buildings work. I don't know, but it doesn't feel good where we stand right now. The one thing, if you're a Saints fan, that you can you can hope on is this channel first round left tackle. Oh, okay, really didn't play because of injury, and I know he's yeah. going through an injury right now. He's an enormous I man to be ready for training camp. Um, the Michael Thomas situation might get resolved. It will so be resolved. Kind of move yep. on. You can push that to the yeah, side. Yeah, he's cut. That's yep. moving on. Right? Like you're so finally done with that. That is you, true. You're done 100%. with it. You're not you know, wondering when's he coming back. Um, you know, Jarvis went through injury, so that he's was one gone. of the receivers you were counting on. A, a, lot, a lot of guys, obviously, went, went through injuries yeah, there. Yeah, injured years, you which, gotta, which also did the nerve damage. And you got a, another year, Chris Olave. He's going to be your true number one. And – you could sit there and you can make a case for a lot of the things that went wrong for the Saints, but it's got to be better. It's got to be more creative. It has to be an offense that makes a defense work and not yeah. just line up. Like yeah. If you just think about it, like with the no motion stuff, like if I just line up and it's base. So easy to identify. Very easy to identify. I mean, hey, so Mike 57, wherever, you're going here, I'm going here, let's go. You know, it's easy. Anybody can Love do that, it. you know. Unbelievable from these two guys. Out of, out of all the videos we've reviewed of them, this was the one where I'm like, "Oh shit!" I, I feel like I'm in the room. I feel like we're sitting. I feel like this is a couple, three old, fe- three old friends. I, I feel like we, I feel like we're sitting at Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, enjoying a couple, a couple cold pops, you know, knocking down a couple, a uh, couple wings, and we're just talking about the game. We're seeing things clear. How is it possible that me, you know, sitting on the couch, didn't play uh, any college football at all? A collegiate player and an NFL player. We're we're all in agreement. How can we see these things? But the coaching staff of the Saints cannot see these things. It's sad. Thank you for watching the video, ladies and gentlemen. We'll end it there. All the links to 104.5 uh, Off the Bench Overtime, their show, all that stuff will be down below. Uh, make sure to check them out. My Twitter, all that stuff. That's where I'm. We're very, we've been very active recently in the comments and in Twitter. So make sure to drop me your thoughts there. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen. Until the next one, see you later.